the twice-weekly air bridge arrives to Mount Pleasant Airport in the South Atlantic. Hello, mate. Hello. In the hold, Hello. military sniffer dog Murphy oh, no. is finally reunited with his Hello. handler, John. Murphy is joining the police support Boy. unit dog section and is the latest yeah, service member to begin his deployment yeah. in the Falklands. Good boy. Nestled in the South Atlantic, the Falkland Islands are one of the UK's most isolated overseas territories and one of the remotest bases in the world. The collection of over 700 islands make up a landmass two-thirds the size of Wales. The military presence here is the legacy of a bitter conflict fought after Argentina invaded in 1982. Since then, the Falklands has been peaceful, though Argentina still lay claim to the islands and the war remains fresh in the minds of many. Today, typhoons, a Chinook and a Royal Navy patrol ship offer protection to the islands, with 1,200 service personnel currently deployed here. The military area also incorporates Ascension Island, South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands and in charge of the theatre of operations here is Commander of British Forces, Commodore Darren Bone. It's a unique part of the world. Many people forget we're here. Whereas the submarines are the silent service in the, in the Royal Navy, perhaps the Falkland Islands is the, is the silent posting. There is everything. You have the most beautiful place. It's a challenging place. It can be snow, hail, sleet, rainbows, broad sunshine in, in, in just one day. The wildlife is extraordinary. Um, you don't have to go searching for penguins. Uh, you sit on the beach and you're surrounded by penguins. And yet there are sheep in the same field, or killer whales, or, or, or whatever else. And at the same time, I think the responsibilities we can give junior people, and indeed those in unit command, are second to none, and that's what makes it delightful. Life down here in the South Atlantic is quite unlike anywhere else on Earth for lots of reasons, but if there's one thing people might know about the Falklands, it's their weather. BS, BS. Weather. No restrictions on the Stanley Road today, but the sheep chill factor is at 92. That is a critical risk to animals in exposed areas. So the sheep chill factor is something that's quite unique uh, that we do here at the Met Office in the Falklands. It's just an index which gives us a good idea of how dangerous the weather conditions will be for sheep within the uh, surrounding area, um, as sheep farming is so important to uh, the Falkland um, industry. The Met Office here in the Falklands is responsible for forecasting for this whole corner of the South Atlantic. So every day at 8pm exactly, they send up a weather balloon. Normally it's released by someone on camp and the military tend to get a little competitive. Today, to try and give the balloon a head start, we've selected the tallest man on the island, 6 foot 8 Captain Rob Hollis, to see if he can get ours to beat the record. The balloon is filled with helium and a small box attached with sensors to measure wind strength, direction, temperature and humidity, as well as a GPS device and antennae to send information back to the Met Office computers. Hi, air traffic, it's Matt. Are we free to launch the balloon? Thank you. OK, so if you just want to hold your hand flat, almost as if you are feeding a horse and try and lift your right arm as high as possible. And when you're ready, let go. Right behind you, Rob. <laughs> Off it goes. Back to those chilly livestock, and there are half a million sheep in the Falklands. That's approximately 167 per person. Some of the farmers who rear them do so in the most isolated parts of the island. And one of the responsibilities of the servicemen posted here is to call on rural settlements and liaise with the islanders themselves. Oh, Hello. g'day, Mark. My name's Chris. I'm from Four Para. How hey, are you? Chris, how's things? Yeah. Currently deployed on the Falklands patrols are Four Para, the first reserve unit ever to be posted here. If they come on patrol to your farm, if you want them, they'll always help you if they can. So, you know, it, to me, it's, they're great to have around, really. You see someone different, don't you? Someone new, you know, someone from the other side of the world, if you like. We're pretty sort of 
out in the sticks, if you like, aren't we? Everything has its challenges, I guess, but I certainly wouldn't swap it for the world, really. And I don't think I could be in an office doing it on a computer. I don't know, really, if that would be me, really. The four para reservists include professional carpenters, roofers and builders, and to these isolated dwellers, their skills have been invaluable. But even the accountants and bankers seem quick to pick up the basics from Farmer Charles. And there's a fence made by four para. Yeah. Oh yeah, they seem to be pretty good at it. They took it up pretty good. I reckon they'd have been good kids to teach at school. They seem to show them at once and they seem to have it, so, you know. And it hasn't fell down yet, as you can see. We've got one more wire to tighten. So, fingers crossed now, nah, it should be good. The work we've done around the farm has involved getting peat out of the um, sort of peat uh, swamp or whatever it's called out there, taking it back. They, they burn peat in the fires. Uh, it's been involved in removing sort of old fences that they've taken down. How are your fencing skills now? I, I think they're not too bad. Charles, the landowner, seems pretty impressed, I think. Or maybe he's just being polite. <laughs> Will you be able to use them when you go home? Um, probably not in the near future. I'm an accountant, so there's not that um, much direct demand for putting fences up, but you never know. How are we getting on, boys? In return for their hard labour, the oh, reservists yeah, are treated to a daily feast of potatoes and steaks straight from the farm. You like it medium? I read, don't you? Yeah. Really, really nice people. Um, they have um, they fed us. Um, they kept us entertained. Really good for a laugh and uh, a really good judge of character as well. They spotted some of the some of the uh, the guys in the unit a mile off after only a couple of days. Trudy is a. Uh, for want of a better phrase, she's a war veteran. She helped the uh, she helped three para when she was uh, during the war. Um, she guided them up to Mount Longdon in the middle of the night, and did all kinds of dangerous stuff, casavacking people, stuff like that. You know, we're just so grateful. You know, it, it's we know they're far away from home and probably not, you know, but they still seem to do a very good job with it, sort of thing. And you know, we're just very grateful for them, really. Oh, life in the Falklands is great. Yeah, and. Absolutely, and thanks to the British troops too, you know, if you know, they're here protecting us, so that makes it even better, of course. But yeah, life in the Falklands is great, can't complain. So, ladies and gentlemen, and my lovely audience in front of me, good afternoon. It's not just the farmers who are grateful for the military here. At the junior school in Stanley, the Gurkhas have come to visit to say thank you for their fundraising efforts for the Nepal earthquake. The school raised over a thousand pounds, and the island as a whole, 69,000. That's more than a 20 pound donation from every single resident. The amount 69,000 that has been raised here in, by the local community is unreal, so obviously there's uh, no, uh, I would find it hard to find the words to describe the community here. Yeah. We don't have tornadoes, we don't have wars, we don't have tsunamis, we don't have poverty. And we don't even have bees or wasps <laughs> to sting you. <laughs> there's nothing that bites or stings even. So yeah, we know we're very lucky. Education on a small island presents some geographical challenges. Farm schools are held out in the country and more isolated children receive lessons by phone. Children of servicemen, however, have their own school back at Mount Pleasant, right on their doorstep. Similarly, the healthcare centre on camp must be entirely self-sufficient, with specialists like opticians visiting the island twice a year. There is a hospital in Stanley, but in severe cases, patients are flown to the UK or Uruguay. Feeding a small island in the middle of the South Atlantic also has its challenges. For all its resources, the island relies on this, FERS, the Falkland Island Resupply Ship. The ship comes in once every six weeks and takes four weeks to get here. Her huge ISO containers come bearing everything from pets to TVs, sausages and concrete. The passenger plane that arrives twice each week also brings four tonnes of fresh fruit and veg. So, Hannah, this is one of four main industrial freezer units that uh, we utilise to store generally the produce that comes in from the, the furs uh, until at such point we can deliver it around the, the various mountain sites. 
The challenges really lie on that 8,000 mile supply chain, but with some careful management, we're able to stay on top of you know, the vast majority of the popular and faster moving items. I think probably one of the, the items that surprised me most has been the clamour for peanut butter. Yeah, I, I, think, I think these things tend to go in, uh, in rotation, so yeah, uh, that'll be you know, the fad for the moment, but however, so, you know, several months down the line, we could be on to, I don't know, jams and marmalades. Just about all the food to feed the forces is shipped the full 8,000 miles from the UK. But the MOD are currently investigating the possibility of using more local suppliers, which would both support the island's producers and cut down on the military's environmental footprint. Whilst furs is their lifeline, there is another ship that the islanders hold dear. HMS Clyde patrols the seas around the Falklands, often just providing a reassuring presence. But she also makes her way right up into the coves and inlets to visit some of the island's remotest residents. So we send a small team ashore, be it six or eight people, we'll go and we'll, we'll talk to them about how they're getting on, uh, if they need anything. We can also take them fresh fruit. Uh, but it's just really to provide that connection with Bifsai uh, and, and the wider military uh, and just, again, to show to them, because they don't often get to see us, that, that we are around and protecting them. The ship has got a massive place in the locals' hearts. Liberation Day, for example, the locals were out, stood on the sidelines in the, in the snow, cheering us on, clapping. The children, you know, were all coming up asking questions. It's something that gives you a sense of appreciation for what you do when you're down here. Because of the close integration of the three services here, sailors can find themselves in close contact with typhoons or going ashore to join soldiers on an infantry patrol. Work on board is challenging and, as ever, the South Atlantic weather systems never fail to disappoint. We quite regularly down here will have 40, 50 mile an hour winds. In March we had 11 metre seas uh, as we were coming back, so that is, what, 40, 50 foot. The best part really is, is the joint training and the joint integration that we can do. We've got such a big open area with not a lot of other users. I think the other thing has to be for, for Clyde particularly is going down to South Georgia. It is a remote mountainous island 800 miles away. You can't get there by aeroplane so the only way to get there is by ship. So we go down, the ship goes down two, three times a year and it's so unspoiled you can sail right up to the edge of glaciers. But we also go down there to, to support the government down there as well. And it's just such a unique place, the Falklands, that it's really like no other Royal well, Navy deployment that anyone can go on. After a period of routine maintenance, Clyde is ready for her next patrol. But to test everything is working, the crew must first perform what's known as a standard manoeuvre. This will test how long she takes to go from full speed to stationary and vice versa, and also check that the steering and propulsion are all working as they should be. Next course is clear visually. To the layman, this rather looks like pulling donuts at sea. Should you break down? Should you break down? Should you break down? Partway through, however, there appears to be a problem. Starboard 10, steer 275. Doing a standard manoeuvre, uh, our starboard engine has suffered a breakdown. Uh, the engineers identified a fresh water leak uh, in one of the coupling um, pipes that feed the, uh, the starboard main engine, essentially to keep it cool. Uh, so what they did, they piped up on the uh, broadcast system, um, uh, request uh, an emergency uh, shutdown of the starboard main engine, uh, which we conducted from the bridge um, to prevent any further damage uh, to the machinery in the space itself. Alongside all the challenges of the South Atlantic come tremendous opportunities to learn, especially for the most junior members of crew. Before long, the problem's fixed and the donuts can resume. As HMS Clyde takes care of the sea, in the air the Hercules patrols the Falkland skies. She too makes regular trips down to South Georgia, this time mapping icebergs to ensure shipping lanes are clear. On the land below, the paras are taking time out to see something the Falklands are famous for. It's such cool days, aren't they? It's cool. In some parts of the islands, minefields have bizarrely created serene, people-free sanctuaries for the penguins. 
Whilst they're not heavy enough to trigger the mines, humans are, leaving them entirely undisturbed. But elsewhere, like here at Volunteer Point, soldiers, sailors and airmen flock to see them. Never thought I'd get to see something like this, to be honest. But uh, They're awesome. They're, they're hilarious. The way they walk, stand around and just chill it, chilling out. Yeah, it's good to get this close to them because obviously I've never seen them before, so it's quite good to get quite close to them. The penguin visit complete, the Paris head back to camp. With few roads around the Falklands, the Brintel helicopters are essential for operations and where there is space on board, service personnel can use them to see some of the finest parts of the islands. In fair weather, the rocky terrain is one thing, but in the depths of winter, it's another story. It's kind of a moonscape. I think the geology of the, uh, of the islands and, and the weather, with, with the wind and, and the rain, a lot of the soil gets washed away. One minute you're on very solid rock, and the next minute you're in a bog. And chatting to some of the infantry guys, uh, one, of them's, <laughs> one of them went in a, a sinkhole that he was in over his head. Yeah, unluckily for him, that was the start of the exercise. I don't think anything was going right for him that day. <laughs> the roads themselves are so pretty good until it all closes in. The fog can come in. You can get blizzards that come out of nowhere. Occasionally, it can not go well if you've driven down to Stanley and they close the road on the way back. And so because of that, we have to um, you have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. So you, you always have your uh, sleeping bag in the back of the car, and you tend to have. I carry ration packs in the back of my car, so I can just hunker down and wait for the weather to clear, and I'm good for a, at least 24 hours. With 85 minefields and up to 30,000 mines thought to remain in the Falklands, if your car does come off the road, there's a chance you may find yourself in trouble. Two casualties. Yes. For this One reason, rescuing casualties from a We're minefield a is a common one. training scenario. At the moment. Right, first and thing we want to do. Let's just get everyone out of line of sight. From, what uh, Al is doing right now is he's very slowly probing the ground with a uh, what we call a mine prodder, which is a pointy stick, um, and he's slowly and methodically feeling his way forward, getting a feel for the ground and anything that feels unnatural in the surrounding ground that we're working on, he'll be able to identify, mark it, and move around it. It could be mine. It could, it might, it could be it could be a piece of plastic in the ground. We don't know, but it's better not to find out. So we mark, record, move round but it takes time. Uh, the little landmines that are out here that are in this particular scenario, they're anti-personnel mines and they don't take a lot of pressure to set them off. How much pressure would set it off? <sighs> I would say between 50 and 70 kilos, which, it, which isn't much, uh, which is a weight of, uh, definitely the weight of an adult. The majority of them are plastic mines, um, which is kind of good for us and bad for us. I mean, some of them, uh, there is a particular type that, that is just as uh, effective now as it was when it was first laid. A lot of them have degraded uh, over time, especially the, the um, explosive components within it, uh, they've degraded. Um, however, because they're plastic and quite waterproof, uh, there's a lot of them that, um, that are still in a dangerous state out here. In November 2015, another aspect of the military skill set was put to the test when a real emergency unfolded not far from their shores. Uh, and on the early hours of Wednesday, the 18th of November, they had a, uh, a major fire in the engine room, uh, which effectively was uncontrolled, um, and uh, they lost all power. Um, and it was scary because as a mariner, I can tell you that the last thing you want uh, is a fire in the engine room at sea. It always happens at night. And in this instance, it happened in a northwesterly gale, which then when the ship lost all power, um, it was uh, vulnerable and, and, and was simply pushed by the sea and was going sideways at three knots. Um, it closed the coast to about three, uh, two miles, in fact, before the, uh, the anchor that the captain had deployed um, took hold and slowed the drift. At that point, he abandoned ship. Everything that we had in the locker was pushed out of the locker. Um, so we were launching aircraft at two in the morning. Uh, we were scrambling HMS Clyde and our tug. They proceeded to the scene at 
seen at best speed. Um, I had six helicopters in the air. The Hercules uh, was the on-scene commander. That stayed airborne for 10 and a half hours and was refueled in flight twice. And we even deployed um, our, some of our soldiers, um, not in a soldiery mode, but in a uh, humanitarian assistance mode because the, the helicopters uh, winched up um, 78 people um, uh, and deposited them on, on the ground where our people met them, brought them back here, uh, where we had an evacuation reception centre. Um, we got all 347 people off. No injuries or...? We didn't issue a sticking plaster, actually. It's Families Day in the Falklands, when little people and loved ones are given a sneak peek behind the scenes at what the forces do on the island. Children clamber aboard the typhoons, the Chinook flings open her doors to civilians, and at the Met Office stand, Amy has some bad news about Captain Hollis's weather balloon. OK, so you have broken a record, just the record for the lowest ones ever popped. So... <laughs> what would you say? It's going to be a hard record to beat? I think it'll be hard to beat, but partly because... <laughs> The floor doesn't actually go any lower, and at the moment <laughs> you're about skirting board, so... Yeah, nice. yeah. Yeah. At least, at least well that's done. something, yeah. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Boy. Say hello. The dog section are also here, and Murphy, who arrived just a few days ago, seems to have found steady, himself steady, a steady, new steady. fan club. Good boy. <laughs> good lad. Yeah, he's, he's doing really well. Um, it's good, we've got him down the dog section, we've got him in... Um, Nice warm kennel, underfloor heating and everything like that. He's, he's loving that. Is it nice having him here? Because you did miss him, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I miss him loads. Um, yeah, it's fantastic to have him here. He's, uh, he's a friend as much as a, a work colleague now. He's, um, you know, been there with me for three and a half years now, so uh, we're, just, we're just mates, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> Halfway on the road to Stanley, the Falklands capital, you reach Boot Hill, a rather odd collection of abandoned shoes. So there's a tradition here in the Falklands. If you're content with just one visit to this little island in the South Atlantic, you leave a pair of shoes behind you. But if you think maybe one day in the future you might just want to return, you're supposed to leave just one shoe up here on Boot Hill. <laughs> 